you know, it was fantastic. But the guys were great. The guys were great. We were so close together as a as a team. But they were really easy to manage. The guys, they were really easy. We we never had a lot of money that at least that particular time. To but we, what we did have was incredible team spirit. Hello and welcome to the UCFB LMA Insight Series, where we speak to some of the most important and influential names in the world of football. My name's Holly and today I'm joined by Paul Lambert, a Scottish legend who won all three Scottish domestic honours with Celtic, won the Champions League with Borussia Dortmund and earned 40 caps for his country along the way. His success continued into his managerial career, taking Norwich City from League One to the Premier League in two successive seasons, and then going on to manage Aston Villa and Wolves amongst many other clubs. Thanks very much for joining us, Paul. No problem. So you were in the last all Scottish team to win the Scottish Cup in 1987. Given the way the game's evolved, with more international talent coming to the UK to play, do you think this impacts on young Scottish players' prospects and the national team? I think it does now, Holly. I think the, the way the game is, and it's, it's an international game, it's universal. You get so many foreign players coming to to Britain and you also get the British players going over to, to the foreign countries. So I think in 1987 when that game was, I grew up with yeah a predominantly Scottish dressing room really and um, we played against a really good Dundee United side at, at that time who were I think all Scottish also. So at that time Scottish football was really, really strong really, really strong. The national team was good at that time as well. So I think but I think now the modern day game definitely has has hindered the national team a little bit until recently. So I think that's a good a good thing. Yeah. So how did winning the Champions League, the ultimate prize, with Borussia Dortmund compare to winning several Scottish premierships and domestic cups with Celtic in your home city? It's a really good question. The first point of that, the, the Champions League is the biggest honour that any footballer can can win, and and I think when you win that, you're in a you're in a re- really really elite group of players that have done it, and um, especially come from Scotland because we're a small country as well, and Glasgow being my home city or my home birthplace really is a great privilege to to be born there. I follow some fantastic players. Kenny Douglas, John Robertson, Danny McGrain, Jimmy Johnston, Billy McNeil, John Gregg, Graham Souness, Alan Hansen, great, great players for, for Scotland. So to, to win the, the Champions League at that time was, was an incredible, incredible moment because never did I think in a million years that I'd have wanted to have, have done that. But I played with a great team. I played with some world-class players in the German team. And then the difference between that and Celtic when I came back to stop the 10 in a row, as what everybody knows, the pressure of that was incredible. So to do that and protect the club's history, I think is equally as important as anything else. And it, every other trophy I've won, I've always viewed it as, as a great achievement. The Champions League is a pinnacle for every, every player. The Champions League is the one that everybody wants. But domestically, I don't think I can ever hide the, the, that achievement. To, to stop the 10 in a row, because that was a huge, 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 huge moment in Celtic's history, really. Yeah, I bet. So why did you decide to play in the Scottish Premiership and the Bundesliga in Germany, but never the Premier League? Well, well Scotland was my home, and that's where I was, I was, um, I was scouted from, really. And um, I, I actually played for the Scottish schoolboys internationally, and... Um, Aston, Aston Villa wanted to take me down as a 15-year-old um, to, to be part of their, their club. And my, my manager at the time, Alec Muller, who, who was great, he came and saw my parents and said, well, we don't want to lose them. We've trained them for two years when I was 13 to 15. We don't want to lose them. We think it's right he stays here for his development. And St Mung was a terrific grounding for any young player at that time. And then I played... A lot of years at St Mirren there. I moved to Motherwell and then the chance the chance got 
get uh, thrown on me to go to Germany on trial. And uh, the Bundesliga was a fantastic league, fantastic league at that time. In the 90s, the German national team was really strong because they just won Euro 96 at that time. And um, it was really, really strong. The national team was strong, Bayern Munich was strong, Borussia Dortmund was strong, Schalke was strong. So there was really good teams there, but I got an opportunity to go to go on trial. And then they asked me to sign a contract, which was great. So do I have any regrets not playing in the Premier League? No, I don't, because I played with, at that time, one of the best teams, or the best team in Europe. And we beat Manchester United along the way, who were a great side. So the Bundesliga at that time was, was incredibly strong. Yeah, I bet. So, in what ways do you think the game changed and evolved in the 20 years of your professional playing career? Uh, the, the, slight, the slight differences. Um, I think um, the game's got a little bit softer. I think that's apparent when you see the fouls that are getting made and people falling over for, for no apparent reason. And VAR getting involved, which is... Um, I think VAR, you either love it or you hate it. I think that's the way to, to view that. Um, some of the things has been good decisions, some of the things has, has been horrendous, what, what you see. Does it take away the normality of the game? A little bit. The softness of the game where, as I said, the tackling is not as ferocious as probably what it was back then. and You get away with things a lot more in my time than what you do this time. So, television. Obviously, the camera scrutiny is um, is big, so you don't get away with anything now. But I think the physicality of the game has certainly dropped, and it's very difficult to compare years, the eighties to the nineties to the two thousands. It's really, really difficult because I get asked that question quite a lot. What era? It's, it's, I think it's really difficult to compare because in the nineties, it was an inc incredible time to play football because of the what, what I achieved, really. Yeah. So, what was it like competing in the 1998 World Cup for Scotland? Great. I mean, when the, when the draw get moot, when we, when we qualified, we, we, Hampden Park was getting renovated, so we couldn't use the National Stadium. So, we, we had to, had to fluctuate between Ibrox Rangers Stadium and um, Aberdeen and Celtic Park. That was the kind of three stadiums that we used. To, for us qualifying, and I certainly think it helped us due to the crowd, because I, Ibrox was full, Celtic Park was full, and Aberdeen was full, so that certainly helped us. And when we qualified, it was just fantastic for the nation, absolutely a great achievement. And to go to the World Cup, and I always said, if you can't win the World Cup, you might have well as played against Brazil in the opening day of the, of the, of the World Cup, because it's, it's watched by billions in the... And we were unlucky. We were unlucky in that, that particular game. But I think 23 years later, it's too long. And thankfully now we're, we're having a European tournament, which is great for everybody. Yeah. So as a player, did you prefer competing for your club or for your country? Oh, both. Both. <laughs> I, I absolutely. Absolutely love playing for Scotland. I loved it. I loved coming back from Germany. To, to mix with the guys again and and play with them. The, the club thing was always your your main bread and butter, as you call it. The national team really topped everything off. With the international level, level was was a fantastic level to play, but I was used to it because I was playing a really high level in the Bundesliga. So I never ever prioritised what was my most important. The most important thing was, was the next game, whether that was the Bundesliga or the, the Scottish titles or, or the national team. I've always kept every, everything the same. Cool. So how does the Celtic Rangers rivalry compare to those in the Premier League or Germany, in your opinion? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Poor. I don't think many people in England understand that. I don't, unless you've played in it, unless you know what it means to the people in, in Scotland and around the world, I don't think people will understand it. It is a ferocious game where you maybe have a week's build-up to the game 
and then you have a week's criticism or a week's grace after the game. The intensity of the game is incredible. The, the atmosphere is, is um, yeah, is a little different from what it is down here. Dortmund and Schalke is, is huge, massive game. My first derby game, I think we played in front of maybe 80, 85,000 people. Schalke away was, was incredible. They don't like each other also, so we had to win. Uh, but the Rangers and Celtic won. There's a little bit more to it than just a game of football. And I think anybody who, who probably says, no, it's just a game of football, well, it isn't. There's a little bit more riding on it than, than that. And, and uh, once the supporters get back into it, it'll be another great occasion because the two teams, I think I've got a lot of respect for each other for what they've done, but the, the rivalry and the, yeah, the religion aspect of it is, is really, really a bit, a bit different from what you have down here. Yeah, definitely. I'd love to see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> everybody, everybody would love to see it. Everybody would. I, I always say Rangers and Celtic could play, could play football on the moon. And people would try and go and watch it because it's that big a game. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. So what was it like having two promotions in two years as manager of Norwich, bringing the team from League One to the Premier League? Do you know, it was fantastic. But the guys were great. The guys were great. We were so close together as a, as a team. But they were really easy to manage, the guys. They were really easy. We we never had a lot of money that at the, that particular time. To But we, what we did have was an incredible team spirit and an incredible character. We had some really good players, really good players, who I was so happy to see them going to play in the Premier League when a lot of people had them probably doubted a little bit. And they had great careers themselves, a lot of them. So I always, always thank them for... For what they've done, because they were they were they were great on and off the pitch. We had some great moments off the pitch as well, where where we were really close. And then on the pitch, we would everybody would fight to try and achieve what they wanted to achieve. But for for Norwich at that time to do it, especially with the way the finances were at that time, we were really struggling. But we had a good we had a good board with good owners, and I think everybody just pulled together the support, the team, the owners. The chief exec, everybody pulled together, and I think that was a success of it, of having the two promotions back to back. That's a very modest answer. <laughs> yeah. So, how are you treated differently by fans and the media as a player to a manager, and what are the different challenges involved? Well, I think as a player's dead easy. I think a player being a footballer is dead easy. Um, <laughs> People can make it look hard, I think. They can make it look hard. But playing the game is great because it's, it's your job and it's something you were brought up to do. I never really get involved with the media side, eh, whether I played good or bad or indifferent. I never really read it. I never really bothered with it because it was a, my mindset was if the manager was happy and the team was happy and the fans were happy, was, that was the most important thing. So whether I, I get criticised or praised, it didn't really sit with me either either way because that's that's where my mindset was and it was the same as a manager i never really get caught too much in the hype when i was doing well and i never really get caught in, in the criticism when i wasn't doing well so it was very easy for me to do that because i think the german mindset when i lived there and when i played there and being at celtic when the mindset was really strong because you have to be playing the day two clubs that i knew to probably never get too close to the media side of it. I understood it and I understood how the how it works and I understood the guys have got a job to do. And, but I never really took self praise or never really took criticism too hard, really. It's good. So, do you think the managerial skills required to save teams from relegation or gain them promotion are the same as those required to win the Premier League and Champions League? Oh, well, it's a good question. Do you know? I think I think every every managerial job is hard. It really is. I mean, I've had, I've been really fortunate when I left Aston Villa. I, I went to see Pep at Manchester uh, at Bayern Munich when he was a coach at Bayern. I went to see Carlo Ancelotti when he was at Real Madrid. Jurgen Klopp when he was at Dortmund. Roger Schmidt when he was at Leverkusen. And the one thing they all had in common, 
and a lot of them was was uh, the players take you to where you want to go, but you have to manage them and you have to get the best out of the guys and you have to try and keep everybody happy and you have to try and listen to people's problems, all those sort of things. So I think if you're, people can say Pep Guardiola has won the league because he spent X amount of money. It, it's not quite as easy as that because you have to manage all the guys. You have to get them to do, to play the way Pep wants or the way Jurgen wants or Carlo or Roger. It's, it's, it's no easy. It's definitely no easy because you have the best players. It's no easy. It helps you. 100% when you have better players, it helps you. And the best players you, you can get, it's probably a little bit e easier that side, but the job is still still a tough job. Yeah, I can see that. Mm. So how do you adapt your skills and techniques to help a team step up once they gain promotion? I think it's, it's keeping them humble, and I think it's keeping them level-headed and not get too, too ahead of themselves. Because what I did find with Norwich, when Norwich went up, was... was how we were going to adapt to staying in the league, where we're going to be good enough, whether the team spirit was always going to be the same or whether some of the lads had switched off and thought they'd arrived. But they never. They thought, well, we, we want more of this. And they, and they stayed with it for, for that other year I was there. I think it's keeping people humble and always being hungry for the success. I think it's, as soon as you lose the hunger, I think you're in trouble. I think you're in trouble when you lose the hunger. I think there's major problems can happen. You think, okay, I earn X amount of money, uh, I'm in the Premier League. And I think what people judge success is different from everybody else. I judge success if I can win a trophy. I don't judge success if I can stay mid-table and that's no success. Success is if you can win things. But I guess everybody's different, but that's just the way I, I view success. But I think the, the biggest thing for me was keeping everybody's feet in the ground and they were, they were humble. That's interesting that it's off the pitch things instead of like, you know, tactical play. A hundred percent. It's a lot off the pitch. They don't become crazy and think, oh, well, we've arrived here and we're, we have to earn the right to stay in the league and, and perform. Yeah, yeah, the tactic side is, is important. The hard work is vital. It's absolutely vital. Hard work is, is incredibly important to you. The tactics are important, but the, you need you need the hard work. Without a doubt, you need hard work to, to perform. Yeah, definitely. So after 23 years of hurt, what do you think it means to Scotland to qualify for a major tournament? Do you know, I'm not really looking forward to it. I really, I think it's, uh, I never ever thought it'd be 23 years that, that our country would wait for another tournament to to, um, to get into. So I'm really looking forward to the games. See, I'll say we have a big one against England, and um, which is which is rivalry. This goes back for decades and decades, which is going to be great. So uh, I think it's going to be great for our country. It's great, and hopefully, if if um, if it's safe, maybe Glasgow or Edinburgh or Aberdeen or Dundee might put fan parks, and everybody can mix and have a great time. Because I think that's what Scotland's missed for so many years. People might not think it, but I think I think Scotland's missed a hundred percent, missed the national team. Yeah. So, what do you make of Scotland's chance chances this year? How far do you think they can go? You want me to say they're going to beat England, don't you? Is that? Is that <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think there's a chance, and the reason I think there's a chance because I, they seem to have a good spirit. If if we can get fans back to Hamden. I think it will help me. I really do. I think it will help me. The England game, I think, will take care of itself. So whether there's fans in Wembley or there's no fans in Wembley, I think the, the, the rivalry will take care of itself. That that You won't need a crowd to motivate you or unmotivate you. That, that's normal. The other games up in Glasgow, if we can get a crowd in there, I think it will certainly help help the team. And I think there's a good chance. I hope I hope they can qualify out the, out the, out the group. But I think that the way the spirit is and the way the team is, is going at the minute, I think there's every chance. I hope so. <laughs> You're lying there. I can see <laughs> <you're lying. laughs> yeah. So finally, for
For those looking to break into the sports industry in various roles from coaching to media to finance, what's your one piece of advice for them to take into their career? Can you just repeat that? I missed that first bit there. Yeah, sure. So finally, for those looking to break into the sports industry in various roles from coaching to media to finance, what's your one piece of advice for them to take into their career? I would say do do everything with enthusiasm. Do it with enthusiasm because enthusiasm I think is infectious and it can rub off on everybody else. I think enthusiasm is so so important and you have to be happy with you what you're doing. But I think enthusiasm because it is infectious and it rubs off rubs off on, on everybody. When when it's negative, it's tough. But if you do it with enthusiasm then I think you've you always have a always have a chance going into any sport. And it, it, I think anybody knows sport is competitive. I don't think you can take away the competitive edge. You need the competitive edge because oh, there's no point in being involved in sport. I think everybody needs needs a competitive edge, whether it's in finances or any other department in a football club. I think the competitive edge always has to be there. Yes, that's great. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been great talking to you. No problem. Thank you.